Okay, everybody's got their weed control guides. Uh, this is a presentation Jeannie made up and I don't have presenter view with us being on Zoom. So you have to kind of bear with me and see if I can remember all the stuff she had and she can correct me if uh, I missed some parts. But I think that was kind of discussion between all of us agents with crops agents and ones with crops responsibility is to help people better understand how to use this kind of valuable little tool that we come out with every year. Uh, so that's why we're doing this is to help you guys learn a little bit better how to take advantage of all the information's in this book. Okay, usually about the middle of January uh, for most of the offices in the Northwest, right after Cover Your Acres, you'll be able to pick up a hard copy of weed control manuals at your local extension office. They do come out a little sooner than that. You can download a PDF online. Uh, PDFs are nice because we'll talk about that feature later, um, the control F feature, but to have them sitting around in the vehicle, in the tractor or in your pickup or whatever with you, it's always nice to have some hard copies. We do have some left. So if you want to grab extras beyond this, go ahead and grab them. Okay. Talk about the control F. Basically it's finding stuff in a PDF, a uh, really handy info tool to have with you. For example, dicamba, um, search term, type that in and it'll bring it up and you can basically go through all the times it'll mention dicamba in there. Uh, quick tip, this also works on several other ones and people may or may not have used the PDF on the private pesticide test to help with that. Um, so remember that if you ever have to get to that point. Okay, so chemical weed control guide to cover many of our Kansas crops, pasture and non-crop land too. Um, I've even used this on occasion for checking some stuff out for lawn care stuff. Um, that's the nice thing about having the amount of buffalo grass we do in this area is there's actually a lot of mention of buffalo grass in this and what not to use on it. So if you all flip, flip to page 12, um, this is a pretty good one of the tables that we use a lot. Names, toxicities, and persistence in the soil. Um, won't give you a direct answer of exactly how long these will last, but it'll give you a good opportunity to compare one chemical to the other in their persistence, if you're looking for that. Okay, and you can see in that last column there, wow, this is not focused very well. But yeah, there's your persistence there. And you can see the all the different herbicides labeled on the left side. Then if you look at this one, for example, like I said, I don't have my presenter's notes. So you can see there, dicamba, yeah. And it gets, you think it's little on the print offs. Wow. Um, great to have there. And you can see it's labeled out with your persistence and that on there. Then another useful charts on page 15, approximate retail cost. Remember this is a cash and carry type price. Uh, you'll probably get better prices if you're buying in bulk or if you're on a program, but it, these are the costs used in most of the budgets for when they figure one herbicide to the other. It helps you compare again, one to the other. And if you also have some availability problems, you can look at other ones there. This is one I've used a ton too. Uh, herbicide premixes, page 18 through 22. Basically it gives you the trade names and then it breaks it down to what's in the premix. Um, extremely handy. If you've got one that maybe is, you found that works, but then you found a uh, generic version that maybe has the exact same components in or you can find that. Um, Another one going back to the lawn care side too, you can also find somebody that's used one that's worked and then you can buy some of the generic ones there too. So I've used that a lot. Again, we're highlighting a bunch of them that are pretty similar there and you can see their makeups. If you look in that group on your page, I said it's tiny on this, but works. Okay, we zoom in a little bit and then you can see the differences between Lexar Easy and Lumax Easy. Um, 
that's Montoclacor, Atrazine, Metri Metatrion, oh, chemistry. Um, you can look at how they break down into what's actually in those two premixes and what the difference is. Flip to page 23 and 24. It's going to be a comparison of your glyphosate products. List the distributor, the form of salt of glyphosate that they're using in it, the concentrations. If you require the addition of a surfactant um, for application or not, and if it's labeled for Roundup Ready crops, um, again, great way to compare products that you have. And you can see this in there. Okay. There, I think that's. See, when you only run through it a couple of times, you forget all the animations. Then we go to the one that, I, that we use a lot where we actually go break down to the individual crops into this. Um, most of the common crops in Kansas are in it, along with pasture and rangeland. As you can see, I think corn's the first one we're gonna talk about. So page 25 starts with the table on herbicides with corn. Uh, show the response of certain weeds to the different herbicides that are labeled for corn. For example, which one's that? Lumax or Lexar? Lexar, right? That's Lumax and Lexar. Lumax and Lexar, okay. Uh, excellent for pigweed, fair to good for long spine sandbur. You can see there how they've kind of coded that if you're looking at it. Excellence E, fairs F, G's good. Then right after the charts with the crops, you're gonna get your comments and limitations section, uh, size requirements, timing for herbicide applications, rotation restrictions. Um, the example here is Acuron Flex and ap application 28 days before planting through early post-emergence, the field silage, seed corn up to 30 inches tall or eight leaf stage. Then the important thing, you've got your rotation in there you want to wait four months for wheat, rye, barley, but 10 months for alfalfa, cotton, dry beans, soybeans, sorghum. Okay, we've got this one kind of shows you the pages that each of these are on. Oftentimes, it's a good thing to have. Get those little uh, self-adhesive adhesive index tabs and you can start marking up your book so you can easily flip to whatever crop you're using most and the pages that you're gonna use most. A lot of ours get marked up like that. Um, again, go to page 92, we've got winter wheat herbicides. Um, some of the reduced tillage before in fallow before planting winter wheat. Highlights the time, sometimes rainfall needed between herbicide application and planting. Um, example of this, looking at fallow master BS. Um, BS is broad spectrum. You want to apply it at least 15 days before planting. Let's see, yep, jumping past the animations, but you can see it there. The reason I put this part of this in here is because it's actually for that fallow period going to wheat, and so sometimes that information is kind of hard to dig out. You're looking at individual labels, and so this has them all combined right here where the, the list to go through and look at what we have labeled for that. So I highlighted that one because it's specifically important for our area out here. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Like I said, this is your presentation. I'm trying to remember all the notes you wrote on it. So um, then we've got the herbicides for the other stuff. Um, you know, I'm more of a livestock guy than crops guy. So I'll, I'm in this section a lot more. But we've got your CRP in Bermuda grass and pasture, and then you've got your grazing restrictions um, in these pages starting about 120. Nice thing about this, this is broke down a little bit different on your, in the book. Um, you go to your section and then it's got the weeds you want to control, um, both annual, biennial, um, weeds like that. I actually just had a question a couple of days ago with somebody looking for cockleburr control. And uh, this is just where I went. All I needed to do was that. So uh, makes it easy. Good example on this. Let's see, the animation, yep. This, Cimarron Plus, 
apply when weeds are less than four inches tall or diameter. Do not, if you're doing it in buffalo grass, again, like I mentioned earlier, talks about some of the restrictions, 0.625 ounces an acre um, max, if you got it in buffalo grass, so you're gonna do some, cause some injury to happen on that. Now we get into noxious weeds a little bit. Um, 146, 147, musk thistles on 149, talks about some of the herbicides there. So you got that marked down. Um, in corn, you're gonna wanna use, or stinger's a good option, non-cropland, toward on 22K, which is a restricted use. Um, so remember that if you're choosing that, to make sure you have your applicator's license or you probably won't be able to get it. Um, Rangeland, cropland, or non-cropland, CRP, milestone. Okay, now for the interactive part. Uh, question, how long does dicamba persist in or on the soil? I can't even give you hints because I don't have the next slide where I can look at the page number with the answer. Three to 12. You have three to 12, okay. 3 to 12 is correct. Again, that's page 12, persistence in the soil, that first table we talked about. And there it is. Okay, number two, for must thistle control, in how many products can you find amino prilolid? Oh, I'm sure I messed that up. As the active ingredient by itself or in the premix? Come on, throw out an answer. So we got one three and some two, a couple twos. Okay, three. Again, page one forty nine, where they're talking about noxious weeds. Chaparral, graze on next HL and milestone. There they are. Okay, next one. List two herbicides that are rated as excellent pre-emergence pigweed control in grain sorghum. So jump to your grain sorghum section, I believe. Grain sorghum's on 52 and Two of them. Okay. Okay. There's actually a whole bunch. Um, yeah. You got a couple of them off of there. One thing to remember with atrazine is that you see that little superscript two after it. It only works in non resistant pigweeds. So, as you're saying, you could probably add that superscript two to a couple more, but. If you find them, let me know, then I'll tell Sarah and she can fix it. <laughs> I would just say on these ratings, it is a group effort when we're putting together those ratings on how we say if they're poor, fair, good. And it's it's all the weak scientists at K-State kind of sit down and talk through some of these, like everything in their research. And so, yeah, that's, so it's not just one person saying, oh, I think it's excellent. It really is multiple of us coming together to have that discussion. And so we're open for discussion on these too. So we we want to know how everybody yeah. else is getting along with them. Since we jumped into that, I know you've talked about it a couple other places, Sarah, and I hate to do this to you while you're eating dessert. Reporting stuff that you think is resistant. Since we have a bunch of people here, you want to help tell them what to tell me to tell you or so kind of the order of operation side call Aaron say Aaron hey I've got this field if Aaron feels comfortable going to check it he can if he doesn't he can call Sarah <laughs> or, 
and we'll go and we'll take a look and kind of we'll ask for like curbside application history. We'll ask for conditions when you like your spray records when you applied it. And then what will happen is we'll say probably is what what will happen is we'll say well let's let this go go to C, which sounds terrible, but we need to collect the seed. So we can do a couple of things. We can either dig plants and take them back to the greenhouse, or we can collect seed um, in the fall before harvest. And then we'll take them to the greenhouse. We'll, we'll screen them with just basically like a field rate, maybe a 2x rate and see if we get some differences. And then if we start to see differences at those levels, We'll pass them off to Dr. Jingling's group to do all the resistance confirmation. But yeah, just you know, looking for suspect things, so lack of control um, that you can't explain with other things, and then having all those records ready, I think would be the big things. Do I have a speaking you? No, I think you know, we're gonna ask for the records mostly because we want to understand what else what the history's been out there in the field. I think about when I was in grad school working on resistant weeds. The history on the field that I was in is they've been using the same kind of herbicide for multiple years and the level of control steadily was going down. And so that's the kind of things that we are going to be asking about. Because one, we know that there's a lot of environmental stuff that's causing, mm -hmm. causing issues. But at the same time, we want to know what we're, what we're dealing with to get started on it. Because we're happy to dig into this way more because we, we need to know if there's stuff going on so that we are taking that out of our options on control. But those, those are the type of questions that will be asked if we need it. And if you've got a weedy mess and you're like, I don't know what's going on, that's fine. You tell us about that too. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the other thing kind of that you're really looking at is it, it's not a like a judgment or an assessment or anything like that. It's just trying to fact find so we we know what the situation on the ground is before we go in. Right. Oh, so guys, you can call me, and I'm not going to tell anybody that you called me or that the neighbors called me or anything like that. We just need to know what's going on. I can have a short memory on this base. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And I just wanted to get that input while I had you guys here so that they, everybody knows kind of the process. Okay. Come on. Okay, another question. Sharpen can be used as a harvest aid in wheat. True or false? So a bunch of falses and a couple trues. True. Sharpen can be used to desiccate broadleaf weeds to aid in harvesting wheat. When wheat is in hard dough stage, 30% or less moisture, at least three days to harvest. So I specifically put that in here because we had a lot of questions this last year on what we can and cannot use to get through, get some weeds melted down to get to harvest. And so the part of the reason I put this in is because there are stubborn products that are labeled that we can go out and use. And they all have differing levels or timing of when we can roll back to harvest. And they have different modes of action. One of the things I didn't put in here is that um, a lot of these you'll see a little number, all of them you'll see a little number after the active ingredient, that's what group number it is. So if you see a group four, we know it's a growth regulator. So it's gonna kind of twist and everything up. Part of the reason I put this in is because last year when we were getting ready to har harvest, I had guys calling and they're like, so is it actually gonna kill weeds? Is it gonna make them crispy? Is it gonna make them ropey that we can't still can't get through it? So that's part of the reason I put this on here because you have seven options and they many of them were just a little bit different. Sharpen is the, one of the burners. And so it's gonna melt the wheat and the leaves off of them. And so maybe you can get through it. But there's probably gonna be some resource that's gonna be showing back up because we're going after the palm ramorant that's coming out of the top of a top of the field. So that's why I put this chart on here because I want you guys to know that there are options. You always call me, we I put out the chart so everybody can have it so we know what our options are, but there's really Seven options in this in this situation. Okay, I think this is the last question. I will use the K-State Chemical Weed Control Guide more now that I know what all is in it. Strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. I already used it all the time. That's good, good.
Okay, here's my contact information. I think most of you guys can know how to uh, get a hold of me. Email address is up there, office phone number, the office phone forwards to my cell. Uh, one thing, I try to post stuff, and I'll probably post the recordings for these on our webpage. Um, they're at rollins.kstate.edu, and we do have a Facebook page, so I try to post stuff on there when we're going to have programs. Um, also listed on the homepage on the Rollins County one if you need more information. But then because I know most people in this area call Jeannie anyways, and she made this. No. Your stuff. <laughs> hey, it's easier for me that way. So yeah, here's Jeannie's contact info, and she's got Twitter on there too. So.